and I was there with my VW car. The, the tanks blocked my car the next morning. I had to ask wow. the tanks to move the, to move their vehicle so I could drive out. Welcome to the Upgraded Investor Series. My guest today is Mark Faber, the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Thank you for joining us today. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on your program. So maybe we can start off with how you're seeing the state of things today in terms of you know, the global economy and the financial markets. Well, I think that uh, the global economy is already in recession. Now, the statistics may not show it because you can do anything you like with statistics, depending on your starting point and so forth. So as an example, if you look at Europe and you measure Europe in uh, euros, then maybe someone can say, oh, Europe is steady and uh, we are flat in terms of economy. But if I measure it in dollars, then I have to t tell people that, well, the euro has depreciated this year alone by 11% against the US dollar. So if I measure GDP in US dollars in Europe, it's shrunk by 11%. Or people who have money in Europe, they are 11% less wealthy than they were before expressed in US dollars. And so I think the world is in a recession. It's not so visible in the economy of the super rich, but it's visible in the economy of ordinary people because their wages are maybe going up a little bit, but the cost of living is going up a lot. And the inconveniences with life have gone up. And through the response to COVID, by governments, mostly incompetent bureaucrats, has been to shut down uh, the businesses of small people, of ordinary people, and to keep open the businesses of big companies. <laughs> so I think that uh, the fallacy today is, if you look at the forecast of uh, the economy, People say, well, maybe we'll go into recession in 2023 or in the fourth quarter of 2022. I think we are in a recession. And two, if you look at the forecast for S&P earnings, they're still up in 2022 and 2023 and 2024. And I think there is a good chance that the earnings for the S&P will drop by between 30 and 50% in that order. And based on that, stocks are still very expensive. Uh, so speaking of Europe, uh, you know, given what we're seeing uh, in you know, Sri Lanka and Pakistan and uh, you know, with the shortages in energy and uh, with uh, agriculture, what do you see, I guess, as the prognosis for Europe in the near term future? And how much flexibility do you think they'll have to be able to respond to any potential uh, you know, further crisis uh, in the future? Well, the question here is, should governments intervene into free markets and into the capitalistic system? That depends on your uh, political philosophy. If you are happy to be a slave, then uh, you can say, well, the best is that the government owns everything and that the government then tells me when I can go on a holiday, how much money I earn and uh, whether I can uh, live in this flat or that flat. The government will look after my health. They will tell me how many vaccines I need to live with and so forth and so on. And the governments will look after my children so they can go to school where some idiotic LGBTQ people will teach my child, well, you are young, you know, you don't know what your sex is. Maybe you're a man, maybe you're a girl. You have to choose now with five years what you want to be. 
and uh, taken a step further, they will say, well, man and man can marry and woman and woman can marry. Why should I not marry my horse or my dog or my cat or my crocodile, which I keep in my garden here in Thailand? So you understand the government can take care of everything. And uh, you can say, well, who then decides? Well, it could be Mr. Noah Harari of the WEF, the World Economic Forum, who's proudly declared that there will be a class of useless people. There are already enough useless people. They sit mostly in governments. So, uh, you know, who will decide that will depend on, on who is at the helm. <laughs> it could be Stalin, it could be Hitler, it could be Putin, it could be Biden, it could be, ideally it would be Hunter Biden, then we would all be on drugs. Or we could be uh, Kamala Harris, who can't formulate a sentence that makes sense. Or you can live uh, uh, in freedom. And you have to choose capitalism and the free markets and competition. And in this system of free markets, you will have people who work hard, who are prudent, who uh, are more dedicated and more disciplined. They will become richer and they will become more successful. And people who don't want to work and who think they can all have a printing machine for banknotes at home and print their money to wealth, they, they will fall by the wayside. You know, it, it depends. What do you want in a society? Socialism, <laughs> communism, or capitalism? I have not seen in history one country that under socialism became rich. Not one. Well, given sort of what's happening you know, around the world and especially what's happening in Western countries, I mean, how likely do you think that capitalism is you know, going to survive as a system that uh, we operate under? <laughs> the best chance for survival is in Asia, in countries where you still have some strong family ties, where you have low interventions by the government into the private economic sphere of people. Uh, there, I think the chances of survival will be better. Whereas in the Western world, uh, I'm uh, more inclined to think that as the government has grown over the last, say, 100 years as a percent of the economy, Milton Friedman, he showed that in the 19th century in America, government expenditures were about 3% of GDP. Now, in 1910, they were in Europe and in the US still between 10 and 12% of GDP. Now they're around 50% of GDP. So the government has become bigger and bigger. As a result, the private sector relative to government has shrunk. As a result, the economy is no longer growing. But in a democracy, this is what the people want. They want more government. They don't want to think. They don't want to take personal responsibility. They want the government to look after them. If uh, you were starting out in your 20s, uh, which country or which countries, I guess, would be uh, your, uh, on the top of your list to, to move to? I still felt that countries that were at the beginning of their opening, like Vietnam, yes. Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, India, China, would be countries that I would uh, opt for in terms of economic growth. But uh, equally, I have to say, if you're clever and if you're willing to work hard and uh, you go to Europe and you start your business and you're working 70 hours a week, whereas everybody else doesn't want to work or only 35 hours a week, 
I suppose you have a good chance. But there's one proviso. You have to avoid paying taxes. So that in Europe and in the US is a very important factor. The most important factor to build wealth is not to pay tax. And it's the most important factor in keeping the government small. If everybody tries and uh, to not pay tax, to avoid paying taxes, then they, the government will have to shrink. You know, people are coerced into paying taxes. In most constitutions, there's no provision for people to pay tax. But what do you think about regions like, uh, you know, Dubai and so forth, where, uh, you know, some of the wealthier people from Europe, and, well, more from Europe, I think, are, are going to? Yes, I, I believe in Asia, you understand. I, I lived in Asia for more than 50 years. I'm a believer in Asia. Uh, I would go any time again to Asia if I were young. But I would do, I would have to structure my life slightly differently. When I came to Asia, uh, the wealthy people spoke English. Nowadays, uh, because of the influence of China, in order to really do business, I would have to learn Mandarin, Chinese. This uh, would so be a precondition. I learned Italian, Spanish, French, German, <laughs> English. So I think I could also learn Mandarin, I suppose. Does that mean that uh, top of the list would be countries uh, that speak uh, Mandarin? So uh, China, uh, Singapore, they would be on the top of your list uh, if you were starting now in your 20s? Well, I, I think, yes, that uh, I'm a believer in China. But at the moment, since you asked me about how do you see the globe, I think we have a complicated uh, or complex uh, condition, which is the arrogance of America in believing that they should essentially dominate the world and that everybody else should be contained. In other words, uh, for no reason they claim that China is an enemy, is a rival. Every, I'm your rival in the sense that uh, we as free individuals, we compete with each other. But it doesn't mean you're an enemy. Yeah, you understand? So yeah. we can be friends and we can compete with each other. Let's say if you go to the Olympics, the other Olympians that compete with you, they are competitors. It doesn't mean they're enemies. Yeah. And I should think that in the world that is dynamic and that is, uh, will become prosperous, Competition is good because it keeps you alert. If there's no competition, that's why it's very clear what Milton Friedman's ideas were, that the government, as not having any competition, will not do anything. It's not a dynamic process. Whereas if there's competition, and this has been described by Schumpeter very well in his uh, series, then people hustle and they try to improve and innovate and uh, invent. This is what makes the world richer to drive everything always to the limit and technology the same. And uh, that is absent if the government owns everything. And I believe China the Americans should welcome China and work together with China instead of putting them down all the time. Because the Chinese wake up one day and say, well, the US does everything against us. They talk very badly about us. They work against us. They impose tariffs. They push us here. They push us there. 
and the Indians think the same way, and the Russians think the same way. At the end of the day, you have a huge uh, ideology gap between the U.S.-led NATO and Western alliance, comprising of uh, a senile president in the U.S., an incoherent Kamala Harris, who can't express a single sentence that would make sense. And uh, you have the uh, Western European countries that belong to this Western alliance, Canada and Australia. And with Australia, the US and the UK from AUKUS, which is basically threatening China because the objective is to uh, station nuclear power uh, submarines in Australia. And when the Chinese decide to have a security pact with the Solomon Islands, this is a sovereign state, the Solomon, then the US and Australia and the UK put up their arms and say, this is an act of aggression. <laughs> <laughs> a hundred years earlier, the U.S. invaded Hawaii. It was a recognized kingdom, recognized by all the European countries, and they annexed it. I tell you these tensions, say, as an investor or as a private citizen, they concern me because... Now, with the Ukraine, if you analyze the situation, the U.S. wanted a war. It's not about Ukraine. It's about taking down Putin. For some reason, some Americans, they hate Putin, notably Victoria Nuland at the State Department. <laughs> and now uh, they are in a situation where the Americans say, well, we, we can't give up. We have to keep on uh, going. <laughs> and Putin, he's not going to retreat from eastern Ukraine. There's no way he will do that. So the conflict could last for quite some time. And it could escalate. Uh, so uh, how do you see, I guess, A, how would you see that escalating? And B, do you think that uh, they might be some confrontation over Taiwan uh, in the future as well? I think that the Chinese have no interest to invade Taiwan for the simple reason that most Taiwanese have enormous business relationships in China and they have personal relationships Wealthy Taiwanese have girlfriends in China or second wives. And uh, the, the, the economies, they're very close together, linked together already. But as you know, in politics, there's a lot of kabuki theater where something appears when in reality things are different. But uh, if the U.S. were to station American troops in Taiwan, I think that may be a red line. And what about in terms of the escalation in Europe? How would you see that uh, potentially playing out? Well, if the U.S. and NATO sends troops to Ukraine, I wouldn't want to have a weekend home next to the NATO headquarters in Brussels. You know, that may be the time when things can really go and escalate. Are you concerned at all that uh, in terms of um, freedom of capital in the future, so whether an investor in the Western world will be able to invest in, you know, the Eastern and so on and so forth and the other way around? Yes, I think this is a good point that we need to consider. First of all, uh, looking at Western European governments and how they destroyed small businesses 
uh, during the pandemic and looking also at what recently happened in Holland, in the Netherlands with the farmers, where some farmers will be so-called so kind of expropriated. I think expropriation is a possibility. And you have to think if the democratically elected governments could act like Mr. Trudeau in Canada and essentially uh, block the accounts of people that wanted to send some money to the truckers, the demonstration is permitted in the constitution, the right of assembly and strike. Then they can do anything. And uh, they can one day say, well, you have money in America. You can't take it out. We had foreign exchange controls throughout history. It's likely that it will come back one day. So as an investment advisor, I would say, wherever you live, you need some money in that place. You can't have it in foreign countries only because maybe you can't get access to it. What would be, I guess, your uh, favorite sort of allocations in terms of the assets that uh, you think would do least badly in such a scenario? <laughs> yes, you asked the right question. Which assets will do the least badly? <laughs> this is a very good question because the mindset of people is always, well, when do we buy? And uh, how do we make the most money? The mindset is not, how do, will I lose the least? <laughs> I think with the mindset, how will I lose the least? We can say the best is to be diversified. You, know, you will lose some, but not everything. In uh, traditional recessions, Bonds, treasury bonds have rallied and stocks went down because earnings go down, valuations go down, liquidity tightens, companies do badly, some companies go out of business. So you don't want to be in, uh, in equities, but bonds, uh, there's a flight to safe haven, to safety, and so bonds rally. The problem is that bonds, Uh, have even after their recent decline, a very low yield. So if you bet on bonds, and I've recently bought some treasuries in the US, but not with uh, you know a lot of heart and conviction, but I bought them because we have high inflation at the present time. Uh, commodity prices, industrial commodity prices have started to go down. I think the recession that is coming is going to be winter time. I mean, you know, really bad. And uh, that in this environment, interest rates, <coughs> which are now on the 10 years around 3%, yeah. could decline to say 1.5% or so. But I, I'm... At the same time, thinking the dollar is very high, you understand? Uh, the dollar has been very strong, and uh, when it weakens, then I suppose that gold will go up again. And gold has outperformed equities over the last six months. It's also been down a bit against the US dollar, but not as much as, say, Nasdaq stocks and other stocks and European stocks. But in an, an environment where assets go down, you have to think the following way. If most people lose 50% and I lose 20%, I'm the king. It's like if you go to war, somebody is killed, somebody loses both legs and you come home, uh, you know, a bit disturbed, but still you function, then you won the war. I mean, it's not the country that wins the war. 
basically the people that come back and are still halfway healthy that have won the war. Do you think in such a scenario that uh, the Fed would blink and stop uh, raising interest rates, but actually start to you know, pump money into the system again? Uh, and uh, if so, would you, uh, how do you see the sort of dollar playing out? I don't think the dollar will go up much more, but you have to call Miss Lagarde, Mrs. Lagarde at the ECB, because uh, she keeps, I mean, interest rates in the eurozone are still negative you know she hasn't increased rates at all she is a criminal that's what she is she's not a central banker but an incompetent criminal uh, employee by the government and she's also bringing esg as part of her uh policies this is a, another idea of lunatics like the people have to understand the greens are mostly communists socialists i understand someone who says well we have to do something about the environment uh, we want to have better quality of air and environment and so forth but i can give you examples in switzerland uh, in an area that uh, in Zurich used to be the nightlife area. Okay. It shows two things. First of all, how government interventions work and what the consequences are. So that area was relatively clean. On a Friday evening, Saturday morning, uh, Sunday morning, when the area was very busy, it wasn't particularly dirty. It was clean. Now, the government comes and says, oh, this is the red light district. We have to clean this area up and we have to open up things for young people, for the greens, and then, then, then. So what happens? First of all, you can't smoke anymore in bars. What is the consequence? People stand outside the bar and smoke outside, so there's more no noise during the night. And people drink outside the bars, and then they don't buy the drinks in the bar. They go to the kiosk, to the, to the grocery shop, and buy a can of beer. When they finish the beer, what do they do? They throw it on the street. Now, if you go there on a Saturday morning, say, Five o'clock, before they come to clean it up, paid by the taxpayers, not by the Greens that used this area with their bicycles. They clean it up. You go there on a Sunday morning, also five o'clock. It's like if the Visigoth or the Vandals had gone through Rome and looted the whole place. But this is how government is. Then the government says, well, if we hadn't intervened, it would be worse. No, it would be much better. What do you think would be the, is going to be the consequences of these uh, irrational uh, energy policies? Well, inconvenience for the private uh, households, for the private people, they'll have to pay higher energy prices and they will have less energy. They'll have some... Uh, maybe some rationing you know that you only get warm water during one hour a day and so forth and so on i mean unthinkable in a free market you go to a corporation to the financial sector who runs corporations nowadays compliance department you want to do something compliance comes no you can't do it's not allowed all inflicted self-censorship and self-imprisonment. Now, if these people were God and had any competence, okay, but they're mostly incompetent people. 
Yes, it's uh, it's quite crazy the situation, especially if you look at Germany now, where they're restricting uh, uh, hot water and uh, power usage to certain times of the day, and they've shut down uh, the nuclear reactors and they've turned on uh, more coal reactor, more coal power plants. Yeah, but the socialists were also in favor of forcing people to take a vaccine, a vaccine about which they from the studies knew very little. You understand? I have nothing at all against someone who says, okay, I'm a Marxist. (laughs) But if he then imposes his will on other people and he forces people to abandon their freedom, then I have something against him. You had enough socialism in your life. I hope you will never go back to it. People here have a very bad memory of it, whereas I think in some other countries, uh, the idea of it seems, the idea of it seems enticing, but they haven't actually gone through it. So the Western world, they never experienced socialism and the young generation has never been to a socialist country. So they don't know. I went for the first time from Switzerland on a holiday with my mother at the time uh, in 1954 to Dubrovnik in Croatia. Croatia. It was at the time Yugoslavia. This was the first time I saw how poor people were compared to us in Western Europe. Then, when I was ski racing for the Swiss team, I went frequently to Eastern Europe, to also Poland and to Slovenia, Slovakia. And uh, we competed in these countries and we also trained with the Polish national team in Switzerland uh, at the time, in summer on uh, Gorac. And they were very poor compared to us. And I was a student, I wasn't working, but they were very poor. And then in 68, I went, I had finished my exams uh, from university, and I went to Prague. They had the Prager Spring. But as I arrived, and the very night that I was there for the first time, I went to a nightclub, of course, (laughs) the Russians arrived, (laughs) marched in. And I was living next to the broadcasting building. And I was there with my VW car. So the tanks blocked my car the next morning. I had to ask wow. the tanks to move to, to move their vehicle so I could drive out. <laughs> and when I came back, I had to ask them again to move it so I can drive in to the hotel. <laughs> but I saw uh, how behind the socialist economies were. And if you look at movies, documentaries about, say, uh, Richter, the pianist, Tavislav Richter, they're very good documentaries from the time of Stalin, you know, the 1940s, 1950s. In one of the scenes, he shows the apartment in which he lived with his wife. And the, he shared that apartment with another family. And they also have a picture of the sanitary conditions. They were long, they had one toilet for one floor, maybe. So they had long lines. And he said the apartment was, was so small, he slept under the piano. <laughs> But he's, a, he's a great artist and he was a very kind of modest person he said, in life you don't need much you know he, he, he didn't have a bad feeling but one of his uh, com- composer friends I think died the same day as uh, Stalin I, I forgot whether it was Shostakovich or Prokofiev But one of them died at that day, and nobody went there because everybody was 
uh, around uh, the Kremlin where Stalin had died. How worried are you that uh, we'll have more sort of extreme politics uh, in the Western world? I yeah, I think that's kind of a possibility. You know, if you look at the young American socialists and people like uh, Omar Talib and Ocasio Campo, <laughs> Ocasio Cortez. Oh. Yeah. It's funny, actually, for me, uh, when I think of all these people, they come from foreign countries. Uh, they come from uh, countries which they had fled from. So in other words, they didn't like their own country. Yeah. They didn't like the political system in their own country. They go to the U.S., but in the U.S. they want to introduce the system from which they came from. They want to introduce Venezuela in the U.S. They want to introduce Sudan in the U.S. <laughs> or Eritrea. For me, it's, uh, <coughs> it's mad, madness. If uh, so, the, the message that I'm getting is that uh, if if you were uh, starting over and you are enterprising, you know, young entrepreneur or investor, uh, taking some uh, diversified portfolio of assets, let's say that includes physical gold to Asia, uh, might be a smart move. Yes, but. With the gold, this, uh, the U.S. Constitution basically uh, has very strong protection for private property. You have the right to life, you have the right for freedom and right to, pro to hold property. And despite this provision in the Constitution, in 1933, uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, he expropriated the gold. You know, you know it's uh, unbelievable. And so it can happen. So I tell people, yes, I'm optimistic about gold, but there is a chance that the government can take it away. So what you have to do is maybe keep some gold in a safe deposit box somewhere, but some gold, maybe you have to dig a hole in your garden and don't tell your neighbor and don't tell your wife and don't tell your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about in terms of uh, currencies generally? Like, are there, like, do you, if you were, let's say you had, you know, like a few million in assets, and like for you, do you care what currencies those assets are denominated in, and also, you know, what currencies are generally in cash? Yeah, yeah, of course I call? care. Of okay. course I care. I don't like the U.S. dollar, but I still have most of my money in U.S. dollars. But increasingly, I like Asian currencies because I think they're quite low. They may go lower. But I like, I like the outlook for the Asian economies in the long run. There are particular but economies. As I said, that you, we need peace. You... Well, I think the Singapore dollar would be a choice currency for me. I think Singapore is uh, relatively well managed. Is a, if you look at, the, at everything in Singapore, Social structure, education, standards of living, infrastructure. I think it's the richest country in the world. How do you see like their role in this whole, you know, US China sort of uh, state of uh, affairs? I think uh, they are more or less neutral. Now, if war breaks out, it will be interesting because they have a very large American base in Singapore. Not uh, aircraft, 
uh, I mean, aggressive weapons, but logistic. They have the sophisticated surveillance equipment all based in Singapore. So, you know, who knows? But I live in Thailand. I think it's relatively safe because we have enough food in the north, for sure. But I just like to say, when the communists and the, the Bolsheviks took over in 1918, they went to the farmers and expropriated the farmers. And the farmers had to deliver the food to the commissars. <laughs> the commissars. They call it the Bolsheviks commissars. And uh, they uh, then had very little for themselves. You, you, you understand? In oh. in extreme situation, I have enough land that I can plant my own products. But it would be inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> but you can I, do it I, if you have to. <laughs> when I was 12 years old, I went to England uh, and... Uh, I was a paying guest, but I worked on a farm to learn English and I had to pick up potatoes. You crawl the whole day, line up, line down. I tell you, if you're not used to it, I had back pains after 10 minutes. Wow. It was a torture. But the people who are trained, you know, the ladies, they could go through the whole line. They finished the line. By that time, I had finished the third. <laughs> <laughs> They were like uh, rabbits, rabbits. <laughs> Unbelievable. So the, it's not very convenient. Nowadays, they have machines to pick up the potatoes. But at that time, uh, the machines were not reliable and the ground had a lot of stones. So it's not a good ground for potatoes for the machines. Are food shortages generally something that you think is... Uh... Uh, something to be uh, concerned about in the you know, yes, you know? it is to be concerned about because it comes from the stupidity of government officials, their interventions. Biden, he says, oh, the energy price is high because of Putin. The energy price started to go up long before Putin, and number yes. two. The day he came into office, he cancelled the Keystone Pipeline. The day yeah. they stopped leasing out uh, land for drilling. The food shortage in America, there's a big story about baby food formula, infant food formula. I grew up, I never had this bloody infant food <laughs> formula stuff. We and were fed milk. With milk and cream and uh, rice and potatoes and whatever. And I ask here in Thailand, you know, have you ever heard of this infant food formula? <laughs> Nobody had. I said, how do you feed your baby? Oh, we give them rice and some chili. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the Americans, they always have this very ideas about this and that and Anyway, but that for, that shortage comes because the FDA closed the plant down of Abbott. And then Abbott complied with all the requirements to reopen it, but the FDA didn't re reopen it. They dragged their feet. But then the government can come Jill Biden, of course, in front of an airplane that carries food formula from Switzerland to America and says, we saved the situation. First, they fuck it up. After they come and say, we saved it. <laughs> That's government. That's how government functions. And Milton Friedman, I recommend to your viewers 
they will know more about economics in one or two hours than by listening to all the speeches of these incompetent central bankers that are at the Fed. They should go and look at the interviews that Milton Friedman conducted in the 70s about inflation, about government interventions, about social security, what it's done to the country. Then they should also listen to interviews We say, a black person like Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court judge. He will tell you a different story that the media tells you about the blacks. He says, uh, I had nothing, we had nothing, and we did well, and I got educated. In the South, where they had slavery, I was never insulted. But when I went to New England, to Harvard and all these schools, I was insulted constantly among the liberals. <laughs> it's very funny to hear the stories from a black perspective, because it's totally different than what the media tells you. <laughs> it's a very specific narrative. <laughs> yes. There are people like Thomas Sowell, and there's a, a one is called Williams or Williamson. <laughs> I have to look it up. He described how under slavery, blacks still had a family. But so, he says social security destroyed the black families, uh, the, the black people's families, with the result that in 1940, 1950, only about 20% of children were born out of wedlock, in other words, just one parent. Now, 70% of black children are born without a father. Social security. If you buy a car, men who buy a car, they look after the car much better than after yeah. their wives and after the girlfriends. Women that have a small dog, they look after the small dog much better than after the husband. Uh, in other words, if you buy something, it's your property, you have a house, you will look after the house. You look after the garden, you clean inside the house. Once it's government-owned, nobody cares. The government officials, they couldn't care less about the people. And Ordinary very... people think, oh, the government is good. No, they look after themselves, not after you. I mean, that's what's very concerning about all these uh, potential nationalizations that they're considering and uh, trying to save the uh, energy companies by taking... Mind-boggling, mind-boggling. They think that through nationalization, things will improve, will get much worse. And uh, what do they call it? A super profit tax. A profit tax is just for, for companies that make money. And how are they going to invest more into resources that we need if we're taxing them more? The chairman of the CEO of Chevron, he said it quite clearly. For the last five years, we've heard that they want to essentially eliminate oil production in the U.S., okay? Yeah. And they expect us to invest money <laughs> in <laughs> new exploration. They've done everything against us I... that they can, and they, they blame us for not investing money. <laughs> I mean, it's very, it's ridiculous what's happening at the, uh, you know, at the administrative level, at the top level. So it's, uh, it's as if they don't understand it's, energy. It's depressing. Well. It's depressing. So I need another drink and I will need to leave you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, being on this. It's been a wonderful interview. Uh, what's the best way for people to find you and uh, follow your work? Well, uh, I have a website, gloomboomdoom.com, gloomboomdoom.com, uh, all in one word, or my name usually is the leads on, if you Google my name, it will lead somewhere to me, <laughs> hopefully. 
Okay, great. Well, the link will be on the uh, description. And uh, thank you again for uh, being on this interview. Well, thank you very much for your time. We didn't talk so much about investments, but as I said, uh, your question about how do we lose the lease is for the first time that I hear someone says this or express this view, how do we lose the lease? Because I believe this is now the strategy that we have to engage in. How do we lose the least? Yes, I'm very concerned about the future, and I'm very much concerned with the uh, downsides of, uh, uh, of those uh, scenarios. Thank you so much again, uh, Mark Faber. Well, my pleasure. Take it's care. Been, it's been an honor. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for the interview.